Thank you very much, and thank you, Terry, for that lovely introduction. Um, thank you to the Cancer Council of Western Australia to, for inviting me to be here. It's really lovely to be here um, and great to have the opportunity to talk to you and to take your questions and have a discussion about this interesting and complicated area. Um, so the very first thing that I want to say, actually, the very first thing I want to do is find the slides. Here we go. Is that this is a choice, which I think is something that we often tend to overlook. Um, but like all choices, you need information so that you can choose what's right for you. And that's the way that I look at cancer screening. And so hence the name of this talk, which is some questions to consider, because to make a choice, you need to get information and you need to ask questions to do that. So what I thought I would do is mention some sort of general features of cancer screening first up and then look at three different case studies. So I'm going to talk about cervical cancer screening, prostate cancer screening and breast cancer screening and then have time for questions. And I think to me that's um, you know, it's a very important part of it so I will certainly leave time for questions. So in thinking about the questions that you might want to consider, I think the first question is, what are my options? So when we're talking about cancer screening, generally there's two options. It's either to be screened, to participate. You might choose to have regular pap smears or regular mammograms or not. Sometimes it gets a little bit more complicated than that, but basically you've got the choice to participate or to not participate. To make that choice, you need to think about what you might gain from this. So what is the benefit? And the benefit is fairly standard across all cancer screening programs. And what we're really trying to do is to prevent people dying from cancer. So that is the key benefit. And like all of you, I'm sure, I know people who have died of cancer. And this is certainly not something that we want to um, be lighthearted or frivolous about. You know, this is a really important disease and something we would all dearly like to see the end of. So that is the key benefit, that we can prevent people from dying from cancer. There are some screening programs where there's another benefit, and that is that we can actually prevent people from getting cancer in the first place. And those uh, screening programs are two exemplars of that, a cervical cancer screening and bowel cancer screening. So there we can not only prevent people from dying, we can actually prevent them from getting cancer. So those are two very, very important benefits, and I think we need to keep that in mind because I'm sure we'll have lots of discussion about the downsides of cancer screening, but it is important to know that we're trading and we're balancing those downsides against the benefit. And obviously, if your life is saved by participating in screening or you're prevented from getting cancer in the first place, that is a very important benefit. So it's very important to keep that in mind. You need to be aware, however, of what is the chance of that benefit happening to you. And unfortunately, the chances are not that great. So while it's an important benefit, the chance that you will experience it is relatively small. There are two reasons for that. Firstly, it's because if you're screening for a particular sort of cancer, say breast cancer, the chances that you will die of that particular cancer are not all that great. Um, so there's Unfortunately, a whole range of things we can die from and dying of any one particular cause is relatively unlikely for any one of us. And particularly true in cancer screening because, as we all know, chances are that a lot of us will die of heart disease or some kind of cardiovascular disease. The other reason why the chance that you will benefit is relatively small is because cancer screening is not a silver bullet. It's nowhere near 100% effective. So unfortunately, that's the reality, and I will give you some more information about exactly what those chances are as we go through. On the other side of the balance sheet, we need to think about what the harms are. Now, this is a, this is a bit of a difficult area because we've not traditionally talked very much about the harms of cancer screening, but it is important to be aware of them. There are two major sorts of harm. Firstly, there's overdiagnosis, and then there's also false alarms. There are other sorts of harms, but those are the two big ones. So if we take them one at a time, 
Firstly, overdiagnosis. This is a weird concept. It basically is, uh, rests on the idea that there are harmless cancers. A very foreign concept, but as the research evidence accumulates, we're becoming more and more aware that there are harmless cancers. In years past, we never would have found these things. But now we have tests, we have imaging devices, we have different sorts of tests that can find things that in the past we would never have found. And so one of the downsides of cancer screening is that it can detect a harmless cancer which without screening would never have caused any trouble. But of course once that comes to light, you don't want to leave an untreated cancer. So we can't tell for any individual whether they have a cancer that's destined to go on and be life-threatening or they have a harmless one. So we have to treat them all. And that's really the dilemma that's at the centre of cancer screening, particularly prostate cancer screening, but also breast cancer screening. So this leads to treatment for cancers that you would not otherwise need to undergo. The other sort of harm is a, um, a false positive uh, or a false alarm, is very important to understand that an overdiagnosed cancer is different from a false positive. So false positive means that your screening test is abnormal and you have to have some more tests, but then they find out that you don't have cancer. That's a false alarm. It um, happens relatively frequently and it's sorted out fairly quickly within days or weeks. But during that time, it's very alarming to the person, and it had, you know, some people describe it as amongst the scariest times of their life. So those are the two big issues in cancer screening that we need to balance against the benefit. Of course, you need to think about how commonly these things occur, and how important they are depends on how severe they are, like what the consequences will be, but also how frequently they happen and how likely they are to, to occur to you. And I will try to give you some information about those things because it varies depending on which, different, which cancer you're um, screening for. So that's my kind of my take on the information that you need in order to make a decision about an informed choice about whether to participate in screening. Now... How you will do that is going to vary between people. So in thinking about the benefit, how likely you are to benefit will depend on your risk of cancer. Some people have higher risk. If you've got a strong family history, you'll have a higher risk of, of having cancer. So the benefit is likely to be greater to you. So it will partly depend on you and your individual makeup and your, your risk of disease. And it also depends on how you weigh up the benefit versus the harms. So some people will look at the information and go, yes, I want to participate in this. And other people will look at the same information and say, no, that doesn't fit with my view of the world. I don't want to participate in the medical sector unless I, I really have to. So I think we need to develop a more sophisticated view of this. It's not just something that there's a one-size-fits-all. It, it is something on which people can hold a range of different opinions, and I think we need to be um, you know, flexible and, and allow that, that process to happen. One more thing I should just mention is that I'm talking here about screening, so therefore what I'm talking about is doing cancer tests on people while they're well. So I'm, I'm really talking about when you're asymptomatic, that's the definition of a screening program. If you have a symptom, like you have a lump or you have some abnormal bleeding, we're no longer talking about screening. In that circumstance, the, I, I think everybody would agree the sensible thing to do is to investigate it. So let's just put that aside, okay, and just to be very clear what we're talking about is we're talking about doing cancer tests when you're well. Okay, so that's the end of my kind of general features of cancer screening programs. So that's the overall picture, but now the details are different depending on which different sort of cancer we're talking about. So now I'll just talk a little bit about those three different cancers that I mentioned. Okay, so first up, screening for cervical cancer. Uh, the way that we do it is with the pap smear, and I'm sure you will all have seen ads promoting pap smears at some time or other. 
We've been doing it for years and years and years. The pap test has been around since the 1960s. And has had all kinds of creative imagery used to promote it. Uh, what happens in this screening program is that a woman has an exam, a vaginal exam, and some cells are taken from her cervix, which is the tip of the womb, that just um, pokes down into the top of the vagina. Those cells are then put onto a slide, which goes off to the lab, and somebody looks at it down a microscope. It's a really tough job because there is about 250,000 cells on any one pap smear. It's an amazing job. So I think we all need to give a round of applause and thanks to the cytologists of the world who have done this job so very well and saved so many lives from cervical cancer. So that's the process. It's been in place in pretty much all Western countries for the last several decades, and it's highly effective. It stops people dying of cervical cancer, and it stops women getting cervical cancer. This is a slide of um, Australian data. You can see there, it's the, uh, it says ASM, that stands for Age Standardised Mortality Rate. And you can see across the bottom axis, years going from, I think it's 1960, uh, on the far corner over there, over to about 2005. And on the vertical axis, you can see small numbers, uh, one through eight, I think. That's per 100,000 women in Australia. So you can see that the deaths from cervical cancer are few and far between. It's, it's a relatively rare cancer. And also you can see that it's been going down very steadily since we started doing pap smears in the 1960s. And this is a standard picture across the Western world. The extra line there is the incidence of cervical cancer. And you can see that that's also been going down. It was fairly flat across the early 1990s. Then we had what was called the organised approach to uh, cervical screening or the national program, which was introduced in the early 1990s. And you can see that there's been a big drop in uh, incidence. That means numbers of new cases of cervical cancer diagnosed each year. So good evidence from around the world that screening with pap smears reduces people's, women's chance of dying from cervical cancer and prevents women from getting it in the first place. Unfortunately, it's not such a happy story in uh, the developing world where cervical cancer is still a major burden uh, and uh, a much more common cause of death. So benefit side of the equation, very clear. Uh, on the downside, all screening programs, there's a price to pay. You don't, unfortunately, you just don't get the benefit without some downside. The downside in cervical cancer screening, we've really only come to understand in the last decade, I suppose, where it's become clear what the natural biology of this disease is. And it turns out that cervical cancer is... Um, is necessary to have infection with HPV, the human papilloma virus, in order to get cervical cancer. And what happens is rarely HPV becomes a persistent infection, changes the nature of the cells of the cervix, and they go on to become cancerous. Now, most of us get exposed to HPV. Probably three-quarters or 80% of the community is exposed to HPV, but we deal with it. Our bodies deal with it and um, we get rid of the infection, and that's the end of the story. But rarely the infection becomes persistent, and when that happens, over many years, cancer can develop. Unfortunately, well, that leads to good things and bad things. Because of that natural history, we can pick up those changes on the PAPS, uh, PAP test, then we can provide treatment and prevent cancer from developing and prevent people dying from it. Unfortunately, those changes are picked up on pap tests, which means that when we see them, there's a tendency to treat. And unfortunately, the rates are highest amongst young women. So as it says on that slide, one in 10 pap smears can be abnormal, and it's particularly so in women who at around the time that they become sexually active, so in their 
teenage years and early 20s. So we get very high rates of abnormal pap smears in young women. And if you didn't know better and you went ahead and treated all of them, you could do a lot of harm. So we've increasingly come to understand that it's actually better to watch and wait oftentimes because most of the time the infection will clear naturally. It takes between 6 and 18 months for the infection to go away. So a lot of the times if the changes are low grade, we can just watch and wait and, and things will go back to normal. If you rush into treatment you can cause harm. And the harm is in the form of doing damage to, to the woman's cervix or to the neck of the womb. And that unfortunately leads to some adverse uh, outcomes that affect pregnancy. So it affects, this is some data that was published in the medical journal, uh, the British Medical Journal. It's a meta-analysis, so it's looking at um, an overview of many different research studies looking at the adverse pregnancy outcomes of treatment of the cervix for abnormal pap smears. And you can see I've underlined there the words um, perinatal mortality, so it increases the risk that, in fact, the baby will die, that the baby will be born preterm uh, and with a low birth weight. So we really obviously don't want those things to happen to women, and so we have to be careful that we don't overtreat. So we have the capacity with cervical screening to say, OK, we can deliver this program, we can get the benefits and minimise the harm. And at the moment, the national program is going through what's called the renewal, where they're look, looking at exactly this issue. And that's why you might have heard there's some discussion about starting screening a bit later and screening a little bit uh, less often. So in instead of screening every two years, maybe screening every three years or even every five years because we want to minimise this harm. So we can certainly talk in more detail about that, um, but that's an example of how we can get a good, a good trade-off of benefits uh, versus harm. Okay, now I'll talk about prostate cancer screening. Prostate cancer screening um, has been the subject of lots of discussion and debate. Uh, it's, the way that it's normally tested for is by using the PSA, which is a um, prostate-specific antigen or a blood test. And what the aim there is to take a sample of blood and to identify men who are at high risk of prostate cancer, of dying from prostate cancer. So it's, it's a deceptive screening program because it's very simple. All you have to do is give a little bit of blood. This is some data, again Australian data, and it's the same thing in the sense that it shows you the number of deaths from prostate cancer. And you can see a pretty flat line there. You can see that um, it's more common. So we've got the line is running along there at around about 50 per 100,000 men per year from around um, 1970 through to 2005. And it's pretty flat. It's come down a little bit in the last 10 years. But not, it's not like that one I showed you for cervical cancer screening. By contrast, this is the graph for incidence or the number of new cases of prostate cancer. And you can see it was pretty flat in the uh, late 1980s and then went through a big rise and then another big rise. That's the effect of PSA tests. And unfortunately, the PSA is, you know, has shares in common with other tests, the feature that the more you test, the more you find. And so we found a lot more prostate cancer since we started doing this test. And this flags the big downside of prostate cancer screening, which is that it picks up a lot of these overdiagnosed cases. Now, this is a very, very busy slide, but it's an important slide because it's data that was collected here in Australia in a study that was done by David Smith and colleagues over at the Cancer Council in New South Wales. And what it shows is the risk of adverse events of treatment for prostate cancer. So the, I've given the reference there and the slides will go up on the web. So if you want to, you can look up this information. But what we know is that treating men for prostate cancer delivers a lot of harm you can see in the first, the very first column there shows 
the number of men who suffer um, or who have various different outcomes who are under active surveillance. So they've been diagnosed with prostate cancer and um, they are just watched and followed su- uh, with surveillance over time. And you can see there the number uh, of men who, are diag- who suffer erectile dysfunction and um, urinary incontinence and uh, bowel problems. And those numbers are greatly increased in the other columns of men who are treated in different ways. Particularly, you see high rates, about 70% of men who have radical prostatectomy have difficulty getting erections. Um, So we know that the treatments for prostate cancer deliver a lot of harm. And that, so this is the number one downside of screening for prostate cancer. So I'll just try to summarise this information by showing you what is probably the best data in the world. It comes from a big European study called the European Randomised Study of Prostate Cancer Screening. In this study, they randomised about 160,000 men to have regular PSA tests or not, and then they followed them up over the next 13 years to see what happened to them. So this is the men I'm showing you there per 1,000 men. So 1,000 men aged 55 to 69 years who are not screened. And over 10 years, there will be four deaths from prostate cancer. So that um, box is the same box that's over there on the far side of the screen from me. The the, um, little circles there represent a 1,000 men. So you can see the background is a 1,000 faces or dots, and hopefully you can see there's four coloured in, green coloured in dots, which is the men who die from prostate cancer. Now, over on this side, we've got 1,000 men of the same age who do have PSA screening. And you can see that instead of four men dying, three men will die. So that's the estimate of the benefit from this trial. So it will prevent one man from dying from prostate cancer over 10 years. This is the biggest, best study that we have of prostate cancer screening. There are some others which have shown no benefit. This is the... um, This one and one other, which was a subset of it, show this benefit. But you can see, as I said, it's an important benefit, but the chances of having that benefit are quite small for any uh, individual. The harm is the chance that you will have an overdiagnosed cancer and have a treatment for prostate cancer that you didn't actually need. So this slide shows the harm. So again, in the far box, you can see 1,000 men who do not have PSA screening, and you can see 55 men will have prostate cancer diagnosed over 10 years and treated. On this side, among the men who have PSA screening, instead of 55, we'll have 93. So we have about an extra 40 cases of prostate cancer treated, but only one life saved. And that's the problem. So quite a lot of those men will go through that treatment for no benefit at all. And that is why we don't have a PSA screening program in this country. It's also why last year when in the the US, the Americans did a big review of all of the evidence about prostate cancer screening. And when they looked at the evidence, they came to the conclusion that maybe there's a benefit, but if there is a benefit, it's small in the sense that it doesn't happen to very many people, it doesn't save very many lives, and we do an enormous amount of harm in order to get that benefit. So they actually changed their recommendation last year uh, to be a recommendation against PSA screening. Now, it's a great shame because it would be great to stop men dying of prostate cancer, but the PSA test is not a good way of doing that. And lots of money is being spent on trying to find a better way that we can diagnose prostate cancer early, but that a test that will pick up the cancers that matter without dredging up all these cancers that are not destined to matter. And then we could get the benefit without having to go through all this unnecessary treatment. So that's where we're up to with PSA screening. That's the reason why we don't have a screening uh, 
program in this country. And I know there's lots of debate and discussion about, well, we have screening programs for women, why don't we have a prostate cancer screening program for men? That information is essentially why we don't have it, and I'm certainly happy to talk more about it if you um, have any questions about it. But first, I will tell you a little bit about breast cancer screening. Breast cancer screening is uh, probably the most contested, I would say. A few years ago, prostate cancer screening was probably the most contested screening program, and now I think probably breast cancer has taken over as the most contested. Pretty much, as Terry said, that we every, you know, hardly a week goes by now without it getting some coverage or a new study coming out and more questions being raised about what's going on with this. So I will try my best to explain to you where we're up to with breast uh, cancer screening. As you probably would be aware, there's a screening program in this country. Uh, it's been running since the early 1990s, and we screen, we offer a free screenings every two years every two years for women aged 50 to 69 years. Uh, women in their 40s and women in their 70s can request a mammogram, but they're not invited to attend, whereas women in the 50 to 69-year age group are actually sent invitations to come for screening. Now, we have a very good screening program. In the same way that we have an excellent cervical screening program, we have a very good breast cancer screening program. Um, the people who run the program do a good job and the quality assurance is very good. So it's a very good program. So the downsides of screening have nothing to do with screening being delivered badly but are inherent problems with breast cancer screening. Again, here's the data showing the death rate from breast cancer. You can see, um, again, it's a pretty flat line, although there is a trend down, and in fact there's about a 30% reduction in the risk of dying from breast cancer over the last 20 years in this country. And that's pretty standard around the Western world. We have seen death rates from breast cancer falling over the last two decades. So uh, you can see, again, we've got on the um, vertical axis the number of deaths per 100,000 women, uh, and you can see that it's running around about, I think that's 40 on that axis, and uh, trending down. This is the incidence or the number of new cases of breast cancer. And you can see that it's going up. Now this is age standardised, so it's showing the increase in incidence or new cases of breast cancer across all age groups. But as you know, screening is only done for women in the 50 to 69 age group. But nevertheless, you can see this trend uh, of increasing numbers of breast cancer. So the possibility is there that we have the same problem with breast cancer screening that we have with prostate cancer screening, that we are finding some harmless cancers now, this is, uh, this is a picture from uh, some research that I did with a group of colleagues in New South Wales. And what it shows is the incidence of um, breast cancer by age. So down the bottom here, we, this time we have age. So you can see going from 20 to 29 years at the far side over there coming through to women into their 80s. The blue line shows you the number of uh, breast cancers by age as it was back in the 1970s. So that's an average of the um, incidence rate or the number of new breast cancers per year before we had screening. So you can see that breast cancer goes up with age um, and then there's a little flat period around about 50 which probably coincides with the menopause and then it goes up again. So if you look at the age group around uh, 55, which is about here, you can see that, oops, sorry, not very good control of the arrow, that the incidence is there running at about 140 per 100,000 women per year. The yellow line is the incidence after we've been screening. So that's in 1999, 2001. And you can see that the curve looks very different. So in the younger women, the curve is much the same. Oops, down here. But once you get to this age, there's a much 
steeper increase in incidence. So that for women around 55, it's actually no longer running at around about 140, but is up here around about 250. So we have seen a very significant increase, at least in New South Wales, in the number of new cases of breast cancer since we started doing mammography screening. Now this data is New South Wales, but this same picture is emerging around the world. And that's the problem, that's why there's been so many papers about this recently. Because it seems that uh, while there is a benefit of breast cancer screening, we do save lives, we do stop women dying from breast cancer, the price of that is that we detect a lot more and we have to treat a lot more women. That's a very general phenomenon around the world in countries that have been doing screening for some decades now and was the reason why in the UK they set up an independent inquiry into breast cancer screening last year and there was an independent report which confirmed that breast cancer saves lives based on the randomised trials that, that were done. Uh, we think that breast cancer reduces the risk of dying, sorry, screening reduces the risk of dying from breast cancer by about 20% but it does so at the price of detecting uh, harmless cancers that would not otherwise come to light and would not otherwise be diagnosed and treated. So how much harm that causes obviously depends on how bad the treatment is. Now it's probably not as big a deal, although you know we could certainly, uh, people would express different views about that. Uh, women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, get treated with surgery, so either mastectomy or lumpectomy. Most women will go on to have radiotherapy. Many will have uh, adjuvant therapy in the form of hormone therapy, and some will have chemotherapy. So these are very significant treatments. They are treatments that you would certainly want to have if you had a cancer that was destined to be life-threatening, but you don't want to have them for a cancer that without screening you would never have known about. And so here we are again on the horns of this dilemma of um, how do we balance the benefit that we can get versus the harm. This slide shows our estimates based on our, um, our work uh, applied to Australian data. So what we've done here is take, we have no randomised trials of breast cancer screening in this country. Randomised trials provide the best quality of information that you can get about whether a screening program works or not. Unfortunately, we don't have any of them in Australia. So we have to rely on the results of randomised trials done elsewhere and apply them to our context. And that's what we've done. And this is the result of uh, work that we've done to do that estimation. So what it shows you is what happens to 50-year-old women in Australia it shows you what will happen for women who are screened. Again, it's per 1,000 women screened, compared to 1,000 women who are not screened. So out of 1,000 women who choose to be screened, who start screening at the age of 50, you can see that about 390 will have a false alarm. So this is screening every two years. So at some time over the next 20 years, from 50 through to 69, they will get a false positive. They will get a mammogram reported as question mark. Have to come back. Now, most of them will have some more imaging. Some few will have a biopsy, but most will just have more imaging and be told, it's okay, that's fine, don't worry, we just needed to investigate, it's not cancer. So that's fine, but of course during that time it's alarming. So you can see that although the chance of that happening to you each time you have a mammogram is quite small, only about probably 5 or 6%, that that chance accumulates so that if you keep on doing it every two years for 20 years, over the lifetime of a screening kind of um, prescription for 20 years, you've got quite a decent chance, about 40% this will happen to you at some point in time. Um, now, this line shows the number of women who were diagnosed with breast cancer. You can see that in the screened group we have about 73 women who are diagnosed with breast cancer compared to 44 amongst the 1,000 women who are not screened. And this shows you the number of deaths from breast cancer. Oh. So amongst women who are not screened, about 12 will die at some time over that 20 years. And compared to eight in the group who choose to be screened. So there is a benefit. 
but it comes at the price of these extra cancers. Now, we can't tell, as I said, which of those extra cancers really need to be treated, and by treating them, we are treating an important cancer early, and that's what's causing the benefit, or the ones that are actually harmless cancers, but we have to treat them anyway. So on our data, uh, we estimate that about we have about five overdiagnosed breast cancers for every breast cancer death we prevent. In England, just to give you um, some comparative figures, they estimate it's about three to one. So about three overdiagnosed breast cancers for every one life saved. Um, in other parts of the world, they estimate numbers down to about 1.5, up as high as 10. So we have quite a deal of uncertainty as to what this number actually is. And hence, the difficulty communicating this. This is not simple. Um, having said that, screening programs are doing their utmost to actually develop information so that they can tell people about this. This research is new. This is only just coming out. So we're increasingly over the last decade, it's become clear that overdiagnosis in breast cancer screening exists. But getting an accurate uh, estimate of how frequently it exists, it has proved very difficult. So that's why this information has not been available until now. But there are efforts all around the world now to provide this information on the grounds that Probably people will still make the same decision that they want to be screened. Some may not. But at a minimum, we need to make this information available. As we find it out, it's our responsibility to let people know about it. So that's kind of the balance of benefits and harms for breast cancer screening. So what I would like to do now is to just, um, again, make the point that this is a double-edged sword. It's a bit like antibiotics. You know, antibiotics are a great thing. They save people from dying from infections. But if you use them, uh, if you mass use them and overuse them, you can do harm. What we need to do is to use these potent things wisely, and so it is with screening. These things can help us, um, but the amount of... Uh, that they can help us varies between programs. And also we need to balance that against the harms that they cause so that we can fine-tune it in a way that will enable us to get the most benefit and minimise the harm. So we need to use them wisely. So it's a matter of... It's a balance. It's a matter of weighing up the benefits against the harm. Now, I think that there is no right answer. You know, it's not as simple as saying, well, let's all go to be screened. No. Sometimes it is a good decision, sometimes it's not. And we need to make sure that we have a more sophisticated understanding. So I've told you about the programs where we have reasonably good evidence. There are lots of other things that we could screen for. We could screen for lung cancer, we could screen for thyroid cancer, ovarian cancer, testicular cancer. But it would be a really bad idea to rush into screening for all of those things without having much clearer evidence about the balance of benefits and harms. You will be aware that there is recently implemented a bowel cancer screening program. We do have good evidence from randomised trials that that delivers a benefit. Like cervical cancer, it stops people not only dying of bowel cancer but of getting it in the first place. It does have its own downsides, but one of them is not overdiagnosis. It does not cause extra cases of bowel cancer to be diagnosed. Now, I haven't talked about it because, partly because it's not an area that I have any particular expertise in, but also the bowel cancer screening program is new in this country, so I can't show you the same kind of data over many years that I can for these other programs. Um, so I think that probably wraps up uh, what I want to say, and we've got 15 minutes left, and I'm very happy to take any questions that you might like to put. That's great. Thank you, Alex. Now, um, there's, uh, Alicia has the microphone, and there's one fellow who's very quick to have his hand up down here, uh, and then there's another gentleman over there, so I think the ball is rolling. Okay. Your figures on uh, false positives for breast cancer screening are, were quite alarming. Uh, I was just wondering if you could give us some idea of the criteria for a false positive. For example, um, if a woman's recalled because um, 
a, a, a film's blurry, is that a false positive? Yes, anything that is a recall. So we got the information, this, that information comes directly for breast screen, so it's anybody who gets a recall. Something is abnormal. So most of that, as I said, will be sorted out with some more imaging, um, but sometimes it won't be, and sometimes it will take a little longer. It will be not only imaging, but a biopsy that has to um, be done as well before she's told, given the all clear. But because we know from talking to women that getting that recall for whatever reason is alarming, that's why it, the whole lot is included in there. No, not at all. It's a, it's a false alarm. Yep, yep. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I just wondered whether you had any ideas on the value of genome, genome mapping for these two cancers and when will it or when may it become financially economical to do? Okay, so I have no particular um, expertise, so I can give you a couple of general thoughts, but I can't answer very specifically on that. Um, I think that the general principles that we need to be very careful about weighing up the benefits and harms apply. So there may be some benefit from um, genetic analysis, um, but I think that we need to be very careful about rushing into those things because of the risk of alarming people and also of identifying things that turn out not to be, um, not to be harmful. I, I know, for example, that in the case of um, Huntington's disease and... Um, mm, yeah, there's another one, uh, hemochromatosis, hemochromatosis, where they initially identified mutations that they thought would be predictive of a high risk of getting it, but actually it turned out that although that was true for the families that were affected, when you actually did those tests in the whole population, it turned out that those mutations existed much more widely than was expected, and it turned out not to be nearly as predicted as thought. So I think... Yes, it's got potential, but we need to evaluate it, you know, with the same kind of degree of carefulness and caution. I think that the downside of both breast and prostate cancer screening is overdiagnosis, is finding uh, harmless cancers. If we could have a test, a triage test, that when we find those cancers, we could apply some kind of genetic analysis to it that would enable us to accurately sort out the ones that will go on to be life-threatening and the ones that will not, that will remain indolent, then that would obviously be a huge step forward. So if it can be used in that way, it may, you know, it may well deliver a big benefit. But as far as I understand, a lot of money is being put into it, but we certainly don't have the answer to that yet. Uh, thank you very much for a very um, informative talk and in very simple, plain language too, so thank you. Um, you mentioned false positives with breast screening, but uh, with diagnostic screening, no one ever talks about the uh, mammograms people like me have who come back as being all clear over 10 or 12 years and then I find a lump myself and it's a bit disheartening to think you've been doing what is supposed to be the right thing but the screening or the diagnostic tools, the mammograms, uh, fine needle aspirations and the ultrasounds do not show up a tumour that's 2.5 centimetres. So have you any sort of comments about that, please? Um, I think the general issue that you're alluding to is the risk of a false negative, of um, being given the all clear, but that turns out to be a falsely reassuring message. It's a negative, you, you're told that it's clear, but in fact you do have a cancer. I did mention that there are some other downsides of screening, uh, I, but I particularly talked about overdiagnosis and false positives, but you're absolutely right. The other one, one of the other ones is false negatives. And yes, it's a feature of all cancer screening programs that um, false negatives or missed cancers can occur. Unfortunately, it's inherent in the nature of the business. The tests are not perfect. Yes, it would be great if we could identify accurately all of the cancers that matter and none of the ones that don't. But we are some considerable way from that at the moment. Um, and it is still, it does still happen that women develop cancers between mammograms or even after negative uh, tests like you mentioned, like biopsies. It can happen. Not often, but it happens. 
Um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, number one is, um, what's your thoughts on liquid cytology as a diagnostic test in pap smears? Mm -hmm. And the other one is, have you heard of a test called panacea for detecting, a screening test for detecting four basic cancers? Okay, the liquid-based cytology one I can answer. Uh, okay, so liquid-based cytology, this uh, relates to pap tests, where what happens instead of taking uh, a test where you put the cells directly onto the slide, you take the cells that you've sampled from the cervix into a vial of liquid, and that liquid is then spread onto the slide. It uh, makes the slide easier to look at for the cytologist, removes some of, if there's any blood or um, mucus, it makes, so it makes it easier to see the cells themselves. And um, it also has uh, other advantages in the sense that it can be looked at more quickly. So liquid-based cytology has been around for uh, a decade or so. Quite a lot of tests have evaluated, uh, studies have evaluated how well it performs. And a lot of claims have been made about it. We, ha we actually conducted a systematic review of liquid-based cytology some years back, like in about 2005, and I can give you the reference if you would like it. Um, and at that stage, what it showed was that it did not increase the, um, the detection of um, high-grade abnormalities. It increased the detection of low-grade abnormalities, but in a way that doesn't really help us because that actually just leads to the treatment of women who probably don't need to be treated. It didn't increase the number of high-grade abnormalities, which is the one that you really want to catch. Uh, but it did reduce the number of uh, unsatisfactory slides, which mean, meant that fewer women had to get recalled. So some screening programs, and the UK would be the top example, have actually shifted to liquid-based cytology for that reason, because it does re reduce the number of unsatisfactory slides. It's again an issue that's being looked at in Australia now uh, by the renewal program that's looking at the cervical cancer screening. And they may well decide to move to it because as well as having these features, if you do liquid-based cytology, you can also, they now have um, techniques where a computer can read the slide. So it won't just be liquid-based, it will be computer-assisted reading of the slide. And there is some evidence from um, at least one study that doing that can increase the number of higher grades. So it may well be that in the future we do move to a combination of liquid-based cytology with computer-assisted because it reduces the unsatisfactory rate. It probably slightly increases the higher grade detection rate. And it can be read, read by computers, which takes some of the burden off cytologists because, as I mentioned, there are a lot of cells to look at. This is a very demanding task. So for all those reasons, it may well come. Having said all of that, we have a really excellent screening program. So we know in Australia that they didn't move to it some years ago because we didn't have... We had a low unsatisfactory rate to start with, whereas in the UK they had a much higher rate, so they shifted to it there. But there may be other reasons um, that we may well wind up going down that path eventually. The other reason is that you can do HPV uh, DNA testing from the liquid-based sample. So, yes, it might come. Panacea. Panacea. Never heard of panacea. Sorry, can't help you. There seems to be a grey area for women over 80. I've never had it confirmed whether... We should go on having pap smears or breast cancer screening at this age, over 80s. Yeah, well, look, we, we don't have any data from trials for women in their 80s. Women were recruited or enrolled into the randomised trials only up until their early, nine, to their only early 70s. So we actually don't have any information about whether it still works in women in their 80s. You would expect that it would. But again, it's going to be a balance of, uh, you know, trade-off of the balance of benefits to harms. We know that the benefit of breast cancer screening does not accrue overnight. You have to wait five to ten years to see that benefit in terms of reduced risk of dying of breast cancer. So you do need to expect to survive for quite some years after you have it in order for there to be a benefit. Um, so it's really a matter of weighing that benefit versus the harm. So if, if you feel strongly about breast cancer screening, perhaps you have a high risk 
uh, and you're fit and healthy and you want to have it, I, I think that would be a reasonable decision. Um, cervical cancer screening, as I said, now that we have a better understanding of the natural history, we know that you can probably safely stop screening at around about 70 years of age if you've had normal pap smears and you don't have a change in sexual partner. If you have a change in sexual partner, then you can get a new HPV infection and so you would want to do it then. Please my comment on colon cancer screening, which seems to be uh, ignored today, I I'm very much interested in the fact that the older age group, which most of the audience is approaching, is going to have an ever-increasing incident, and yet you're ignoring it today, for example. Um, I'm not ignoring it. Um, I might possibly ask Terry to comment. It's um, what I wanted to do was to describe some general features about how we approach cancer screenings and I use those three examples because they're the ones that I'm most familiar with. But we do have good evidence from randomised trials that bowel cancer screening can reduce the risk of dying from bowel cancer, whether you screen by a faecal occult blood test, which is the, the program that's being introduced here, or you screen by colonoscopy. Um, there are risks involved. The risks mainly relate to having adenomas found in the bowel which then have to be removed So you, yeah, and, and you have to have a colonoscopy if you have a, an abnormal test in the first place. So you have to have a colonoscopy. You need to have those adenomas uh, removed. But having said that, you know, that's, it's a good balance of benefit to harm for bowel cancer screening and that's why the government has made the decision to go ahead and implement the program uh, more, more widely through the community, including to older ages. I'm sure Terry will know more about this, but I think they have announced that they're going to extend the program for people aged 50, 55, 60, 65 and 70. And 70. Yeah. Uh, just, I know you've only got one minute left, Alex, but... Can, could you just say something very quickly about the implications of the HPV vaccination for cervical screening? <laughs> oh, okay, so the HPV vaccination is a really great idea because this whole problem comes about because we get infected with HPV, the aggressive strains of HPV. The randomised trials of the vaccine have shown that it reduces the risk of developing high-grade abnormal cervical changes and uh, cervical cancer. So that's a good benefit. It also reduces the risk of getting um, warts, genital warts. So that's you know less important, but nevertheless a very important benefit for quality of life. Uh, I'm not expert in it, but I understand from my colleagues who are that the observational data in Australia show that since we've started using the vaccine, that rates of high-grade lesions amongst young women and rates of genital warts are falling. So it seems very likely that it is working in the way that we expected it to work. In the fullness of time, when everybody is vaccinated... Whether we can actually get rid of cervical cancer altogether, I don't know. But it's certainly very plausible that as time goes on, the benefit of screening will get less and less because there will be even less of this disease to prevent. You know, I showed you the numbers are very small. It's a rare cancer in this country. So, you know, it may come a time when we no longer need screening. But I, I can't answer as to when that would be. Um, I will quickly pick up on the gentleman's question about col uh, what he called colon cancer and, and Alex is called bowel cancer, colorectal cancer, colon and the rectum, making up the total of the bowel is the kind of screening we're talking about and the Cancer Council is very actively uh, lobbying both sides of politics now that we have an election in the wind uh, to increase the extent to which bowel cancer screening is offered to people in Australia. It started with a program inviting people at the age of 55 and then again at 65. Uh, and then the age 50 was introduced in 2007 uh, or 2008. Uh, and then only last month did we introduce people turning 60 into that mix. What we hope is that bowel cancer screening will be invite people will be invited, both men and women, uh, every two years, because that's where the randomised control trial evidence comes for the effectiveness for bowel cancer screening. So it's actually one that we're very actively lobbying the federal government to increase in terms of the screening program and increase the investment. And we believe that there's a substantial benefit 
and a substantial return on the investment of that program. So it's one that we're very much championing.